Um, there's no one who embodies this crossover between AI and neuroscience more than Terry Sanowski. Um, he the man um, who's going to talk about the global brain. <clears throat> So I could not have asked for two better introductory talks to what I'm <laughs> going to tell you about today. Because uh, I think that we're seeing two simultaneous revolutions occurring that are, are just spectacular. On the one hand, you've heard about uh, from Blaze the fact that uh, these artificial neural networks are now invading your cell phone, unbeknownst to me or to you. And at the same time, neuroscientists are discovering incredible new uh, discoveries with new optical recording techniques at the level of single synapses. This is really a, a fantastic intersection between these two fields. And in fact, it's really uh, why we're here, in fact, to see if there is uh, going to be uh, a, 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 a synergies that could form between the two. Now, I'm going to tell you something about a problem uh, and I want to put uh, the artificial neural networks into the perspective of the cortex. So here we have uh, the surface of the cerebral cortex. There's on the order of 10 billion neurons in the cortex. Um, and I want to compare that with the biggest uh, deep learning networks. Could fit into a cubic millimeter of the cortex. These, these, in the cubic millimeter of the cortex is about a billion synapses. That's about the size of the biggest uh, deep learning networks that are now being used. And, and what that means is that if you have a brain uh, that has on the order of 10 to the fifth uh, cubic millimeters, that means you could fit about 100,000 deep learning networks. And there probably are around that many deep learning networks now at Google. But the question is, how do you integrate all that information from all of that, these uh, specific narrow domain networks that have been trained up to do specific things? Somehow, the, we do that in our cortex. We could recognize songs. Uh, when you meet a new person, uh, the visual system uh, in the back of the brain uh, recognizes the face, um, the auditory system in the, here in, in the middle, uh, will recognize the sound of the person, and somewhere here in the language areas, you'll remember the name. The problem is that there are very few connections between these different areas. And oh, you might also shake their hand. You may remember that it was cold, right? All of those memories are stored, distributed throughout the cortex. That's the global brain. How does that integrate it? How is it that single uh, experience that you have, meeting that person allows you the next day to remember their name and that particular uh, uh, auditory, their, their voice, and so forth. Now, let's look back at the way that neuroscientists have gathered information from the global brain, recording primarily one neuron at a time uh, throughout the entire cortex. I mean, it's amazing that the, the, when David Hubel and Torsten Weasel record from single cortical neurons in the visual cortex uh, with the tungsten microelectrode, this was the Microelectrode that this is the experiment that launched a thousand microelectrodes throughout the entire cortex, and and so now we have a kind of a, a overall global picture. But what I want to tell you about today is another kind of a picture that could only have been created by recording from arrays of electrodes. And I want to start with the air, a part of the brain which is thought to be the most important for stabilizing long-term memories of events and specific objects. And that's the hippocampus. Now, it's been known for a long time. There's a huge oscillation called theta, four to eight hertz, that occurs when a rat is exploring its environment. And if you record from one electrode, indeed, you see an oscillation. But if you record from an array of electrodes, as Thanos Siapas did and, and reported in, 19, in 2008, What you will see instead is a traveling wave along the axis of the hippocampus. Theta is not an oscillation. It's not a synchronous oscillation. It is a traveling wave that has spatial as well as temporal properties. And I'm here to tell you today 
that every single oscillation, and they're all over the place in many frequencies. There's uh, delta oscillations, which are two to four hertz. There's gamma oscillations, which is 30 to 80 hertz. They're not oscillations, they are traveling waves. And I'm gonna be focusing on one particular traveling wave that we've studied over the last 20 years, and I say we with Mircea Steriad, David McCormick, and others, which is the sleep spindle, and, and, and what role that might play in uh, memory consolidation. Now, just to follow up on the hippocampal wave, we know that uh, if you go down CA1 uh, from the dorsal to the ventral regions of the rat hippocampus, that the place fields, the region of the environment where the, fi the cell will fire, uh, they get larger and larger and larger. And if one looks at the consequence of having a traveling ways, it means that the f spike firing here in the dorsal part is going to precede the spike firing in the ventral part. And uh, that could be up to 70 milliseconds. And if spike time dependent plasticity of the sort that Mu Ming Pu uh, told you about occurs in the hippocampus, which we know is true from work that was done by Mu Ming Pu and others, that means that the spike timing is going to be offset in terms of the uh, different cells firing at different times. And indeed, uh, this is actually from the original B and Pooh uh, paper, which uh, he told you about very beautifully, that if you pair pre before post within 20 milliseconds, you can increase by a factor of two, or post before pre, you can decrease by a factor of two. However, this has to be done at 10 hertz or higher. If you do the pairing at five hertz, you get nothing. Or if you do it at one hertz, you get nothing. Right, Wu Ming? Okay. That's very important. Now, when you fall asleep, it's not the case that your brain activity disappears. It just changes into a completely different form. It goes from what's called desynchronized, which is uh, low amplitude, higher frequencies, to low frequencies down to the you know, 10, two to four hertz range, but very high amplitude and globally coherent across the entire cortex. So you go from awake down to slow wave sleep, and during the night you go back and forth between slow wave sleep and rapid eye movement sleep, which is dream sleep. But in stage two, uh, as you can see here, uh, which is uh, you, have to <laughs> you have to go between uh, the, the, the two different stages, you always have to stop at intermediate level sleep, and you spend about half of the night, half of the, the time in intermediate sleep. And intermediate sleep is characterized by sleep spindles. Sleep spindles are 10 to 14 hertz uh, in the human brain. They last about two seconds, as you can see here. And they occur thousands of times during the night. You spend half your time spindling. Now, we have a theory when I say we, I mean the, f the whole uh, field of primarily uh, studying rodents, but uh, there's a lot of evidence in humans that experiences you've had during the day when you're awake uh, are imprinted both in the cortex and in the hippocampus. But without the hippocampus, uh, we, we have cases of humans that uh, have had lesions in the hippocampus, they can't form new long-term memories. In other words, it's not possible for them to remember uh, the next day what they did the previous day. And the, 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 the theory, uh, of which is a lot of evidence, is that what's happening is when you fall asleep, uh, the hippocampus plays back previous experiences and events of the day, and that information is integrated into the cortical store, which is much, much larger than the hippocampus. And, and that occurs over and over, day after day, so that eventually you don't need the hippocampus for that long-term memory. It's become integrated into all the other information in the rest of the cortex. And the sleep spindles are thought to be the key in that playback. Such that after all of the, uh, and the REM, of, of course, when the REM occurs, what's happening is the cortex is becoming activated and the hippocampus is listening. So there's a, there's a back and forth, back and forth, back and forth during the night. But at the end of the uh, consolidation period, uh, the idea is that uh, the cortical, new cortical connections are formed which have that information. And it's really important to do that over time. And the reason is that you don't want to mess up and interfere with existing memories. You want to integrate the new experience with the old ones in an efficient way. It's called interference. Now, here are recordings from a cat by Mircea Steriad. And he was recording simultaneously from six places in the thalamus, which feeds into the cortex, layer four. 
and then uh, two electrodes distantly spaced in the cortex. And you can see here very nicely the spindle episodes starting first in the thalamus where they're generated, but then through feed forward and feedback connections with the cortex, synchronized across the entire cortex. So here is, here's the time scale, five seconds. So they're, they repeat every five to 10 seconds. Uh, here's a blow up. You can see how beautiful these spindles occur. They're bursts, uh, spikes, not just single spikes. And not all the neurons, but a very small subset of all the neurons in the cortex. Now, why do we think that spindles have anything to do with memory consolidation? So here's an experiment by Sarah Mednick in humans. And uh, she had, it was a word association pair. You give the subject a list of pairs of words that they have to associate that are random pairs. So they memorize them, they take a nap, and then you ask, how many can you remember, right? So here's the, uh, and you also measure the number of spindles. So here's the spindle density, uh, and here are the, 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 the learned pairs, right? The, the amount of memory of uh, the learning that has, been, has occurred. But now you uh, take the subject and do the same experiment, but now instead of a placebo, you give them zolpidem. And this is a, uh, a sleeping pill, Ambien. Interestingly, uh, Ambien increases the density of spindles by a factor of two. It also increases the uh, number of remembered word pairs. So I can see that uh, David is, doesn't believe this because he's smiling. So this is very interesting. Now, Ambien is an interesting drug. It's a hypnotic. But it, you know, it's known that if you take Ambien, as I did when I came here on the <laughs> red eye, that you actually don't remember uh, the next day how you actually got to the hotel. So how could it improve memory? Well, the reason is you take the Ambien and you can't remember things after you take the Ambien. But if you take the, you'd first do the learning and then take the Ambien, you can improve. So you can see that there's a yin yang here, David. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Okay, okay, now I wanna tell you about something that is totally, uh, something that for me, just, it's like a revelation. And it really is, is something that I never expected. I worked on sleep spindles for 20 years. I have published a book on the biophysical mechanism underlying the bursting in the thalamus through the reticular nucleus uh, reciprocal inhibitory loop. And you know, we know every detail. This is the best understood oscillation. But it turns out that, that as I've already told you, it's actually not gonna be a synchronous oscillation as we all thought. Mirch and Steriod, everybody thought. And this came not from recording from cats, but from humans. These are recordings in epilepsy patients who had grid electrodes placed on the surface of the cortex in order to uh, isolate the location where the seizure starts so that the surgeon can come in. And these are drug-resistant epilepsies. So this is the last chance to, to stop the epilepsy by taking out the, 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 where it starts. And as you can see in the uh, eight by eight 64 electrode grid, you can record over the lateral surface of one of the hemispheres. And what I've done here is to normalize the, uh, uh, the, the ECOG uh, recordings, which are in the order of 10 microvolts. And uh, shown here is uh, one of the uh, locations in red. And as you can see, it oscillates back and forth. Uh, this is a sleep spindle. But if you look across the grid, uh, some of them are at high levels and some of them are at low levels. And if we play this as a movie, we'll see something very interesting. So if you just follow the white ones around, I think you will see that they form a circular traveling wave going from the temporal cortex to the parietal cortex to the prefrontal cortex. So something like this. We call them Princess Leia waves. <laughs> now, if you look at uh, the direction where the phase of the traveling wave is increasing the fastest, the gradient, it really forms this uh, very beautiful circular pattern. And this is true about half of the waves. The other ones, <laughs> interestingly, of the ones that are circular, uh, there's a, there's of, of them, about 70% uh, go in this direction and 30% go in that direction. So it's not completely stereotyped. However, if two cycles, this is that was one cycle, but if two cycles 
happen to be highly correlated, this is the degree to which uh, the two cycles are correlated, then that particular pattern will uh, be repeated hundreds of times during the night. The ones that uh, don't follow one cycle to the next uh, are below chance. So this is interesting. It's as if there's selective patterns that are repeated over and over again. They're not all treated equally. And, and in order, if, 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 that, it, it, what's the precision of this? We can actually look at the degree to which one cycle uh, follows the next in terms of the uh, phase difference. Uh, it, depending on, it depends on the, the, the precision of the spindle, depends on the correlation of two pairs uh, of a pair of spindles. And you can see that for the ones that are repeated the most, they have the highest degree of precision on the order of five milliseconds or less. And that turns out to be the kind of precision you need for spike time dependent plasticity. You can see where I'm going here, is that there's timing involved in the relative timing of the, of the uh, bursts that are occurring, the sleep spindle burst, at different locations in the brain. Now, let's suppose it was absolutely synchronous, right? And suppose that this was bursting at the same time as that, and that's illustrated here. This is now just a, a hypothetical diagram. Um, if it were the case, then uh, you get a burst here, 20 milliseconds later, you're going to get a burst here. That's post before pre, and we know that that pairing is going to give you long-term depression. So this would actually ruin long-distance connections. All those long-distance connections would be decreased by depression, and so you disconnect the cortex, basically, the, long, the white matter. Um, and of course, that's not what happens. What happens is that you have a... Um, Traveling wave, which means it takes 20 milliseconds for the traveling wave to get here just in time, so the bursting occurring here occurs at the same time that the synaptic input is getting here. So that, that puts you into the same ballpark. But we can do better than that. We can develop a model, a very simple model, just a proof of principle. And this is based on a very famous one that goes way back, uh, work that was done by Kurumato and many others. Uh, who were, uh, for example, uh, lamprey swimming. Uh, there's a, Nancy Capel has a beautiful model. <coughs> and here's the idea. The idea is you have coupled oscillators and that the uh, input to one oscillator uh, is given by the difference in the uh, phase between uh, the two oscillators so that uh, in the current model model, basically at the end of the synchronization, they all are firing at the same time. So it's a way of synchronizing oscillators. The difference between that model and the one I'm going to show you <coughs> is that we put in time delays. And that changes the character. It doesn't synchronize. And so here is the uh, simple model, eight, uh, six, eight by eight. Each is an oscillator, and we put in long-range connections that, of the sort that we see from human connectomics. We also have inputs from the thalamus. This is a very, very simple model. But again, in terms of proof of principle, uh, here's the connectivity between uh, the cortex and the thalamus. We know there are feedback connections. Those are in there, too. But when we actually simulate it, what you can see is that within one or two cycles, you can get beautiful circular traveling waves. It's, 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 really, it's really fascinating to think that you know, the cortex is a medium with which uh, the waves can travel through it. And by the way, if you look in physics, you know, how is information transmitted in physics between two locations? Electromagnetic waves are traveling waves. What about pressure waves, sound? Those are traveling waves. Wa traveling waves are a way that you communicate information. And the, the, uh, if this uh, works, that is to say, if this whole process works, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're in addition to having uh, strengthened uh, and change the strengths of synapses locally within each module, we'll have connected them together across the cortex, creating a global, globally integrated workspace for being able to link together all the different parts uh, of, of your memory of a, a particular event. Now, okay, that's where we were about two years ago. This is a paper in eLife on humans. The question, we always get this question, those are epilepsy patients, maybe this is uh, some kind of uh, artifact. So we collaborated with April Benesich, who's here at Rutgers Newark, and did a similar analysis of recordings from the baby EEG. And as you heard, babies have a tremendous amount of synaptogenesis going on during the first year of life. And, and her EEG recordings were uh, from ages six months to uh, two years. Babies have very thin skulls. 
In fact, it's, it's uh, not just thin, but the sutures haven't closed, and it's, uh, it's soft. And that means that recording from EEG from the surface of the scalp is almost as good as ECOG. And I'm going to show you something here for the first time in public, is what the baby's brain looks like when it's sleeping and spindling. Now remember, in human, we only got one hemisphere. So now we're going to be looking at it globally looking down. This is dense EEG recordings. It swirls across the whole cortex. This is global. This is not just a local oscillation. It's not synchronous. It goes on and on and on. Okay, that's looking at it from above. Let's look at it from the side. So these, these really are traveling ways. They're really special. And, and the reason why I think it's important is that oscillations by themselves, especially syn synchronous oscillations, are really boring because all the neurons are doing the same thing. It's effectively one big neuron. But with a traveling wave, you're spreading the information across the medium, in this case, the cortex. Now, this is all observational. Is, is there any impact? Do the traveling waves have any impact on behavior? So we teamed up with John Reynolds to record from area MT in the marmoset. And we used the Utah array, which is a array of 100 electrodes. If we can bring it up, there it is. 100 electrodes, uh, it's kind of a bed of nails that you pound into the cortex. So you can record simultaneously from 100 locations over the entire area MT. And this is an area that's beloved to Tony Movshun, who spent many years recording from one neuron at a time. <laughs> and here's something you can never see by recording from one neuron. You could never see that it's actually maybe a traveling wave there. So here's, here's the uh, electrode array placement. And here now is a uh, similar format that you saw for the human ECOG, but now this is an awake uh, behaving marmoset, area MT. In this case, <clears throat> when the animal is just quietly sitting there. In this case, uh, the, the traveling wave is 10 hertz. It's traveling waves all the way down, Tony. Okay, so here's the experiment. You ask the animal to fixate. And then uh, you're recording from uh, neurons up here in MT, and you give uh, a, a very weak stimulus so that they only detect it half the time, a drifting Gabor. And then uh, they have to saccade if they see it. And so here's the uh, contrast uh, curve in which we have uh, the performance as a function of contrast. And so we, we set it at around 50%. And then we ask, how is their performance related to the traveling wave passing through? And uh, so he here is... Uh, the stimulus uh, recording, now this is the uh, local field potential, and these little dots are trials. And you can see that you get a nice uh, event-related potential here. And here is the result. Uh, first of all, uh, just on the behavioral level, uh, this is the phase of the wave, and this is the percent uh, of uh, tar <coughs> hit the targets that are hit. And you can see that uh, it's when the phase of the wave is plus or minus pi, and that's when the cells are the most depolarized in that region. And the, sa the same thing is true of neuronal activity. That's because they're closer to the threshold. And in fact, if you actually look at the, uh, the phase alignment and, and do an analytic uh, uh, comparison between the hits and the misses, you can see that it's, it's extraordinarily highly correlated at the 0.001 level. This is very significant. This is a huge impact on behavior. <clears throat> so, my last, <clears throat> <clears throat> the question I, I, I'd like to investigate uh, is, uh, over the next few years, is uh, what computational role could a traveling wave have? I mean, what makes it different than just an oscillation? So, the, look, the, the, the view that we have right now really comes from Hubel and Weasel, and what do they do? Their experiment is to flash a stimulus, a bar, or an oriented bar, or an edge. And they watch the bursts of firing of neurons uh, in the visual cortex as a, a, a very uh, strong peak, and then it falls off. 
and, and then you vary the orientation and other parameters. And so if you think about that, that was, is going to, if that, you know, according to the traditional view, that will propagate up from V1 to V2 to V3. It's as if a particular moment in time is uh, going to be represented sequentially as you go up the way that it would in the feed-forward network. Uh, <clears throat> but there's another possibility. And, and it's known that when you flash a spot, that this causes a traveling wave to occur in, in V1, it's been measured, which is like ripples in a pond, slowly expanding, which means that there's a history of the stimulus well after it's gone, which is spreading through long-range horizontal connections within V1. Now, physicists have looked at this, the propagation of information on the surface of a, uh, in this case, a uh, oil bath. They, what they did was they, they dropped a silicone ball and it hopped across these red, these uh, blue uh, uh, marks here, across this pond, producing these interfering ripple patterns, right, of increasing radius with time. Now here's what they, th th this is an experimental group, but they did some theory. What they showed was that uh, if you look here at this point here uh, and look at the ripple pattern, you can reproduce the entire pattern of the stimulus, all these bounces. So there's information about recent history that is contained in the, the pattern of activity on the surface of that pond. And if you think of the cortex as kind of a surface of a pond, it's a medium. Things propagate through it. Not unlike this experiment, but metaphorically at least. And they were even able to, knowing that knowledge, they were able to reverse the course of the bouncing ball uh, and then bring it back to its initial position. This is really quite remarkable because it's telling us that the, maybe we should have a different view uh, because the world is not a bunch of flashes unless you're in a disco hall. It's a continuously changing pattern. I see heads bobbing, I, th I see things moving around, and, and that's producing a continuous input. This continuous input is causing waves and ripples throughout the entire V1 that are interfering with each other, but contain the entire history over the last 100 milliseconds. And so what's passed on from V1 to V2 is not a snapshot of what's happening right now. It's a snapshot of what happened over the last 100 milliseconds. And so that then is being processed as, not as, as, as a chunk. It's, it's, a, it's a really a window, as a history uh, over a window of time, not just a particular moment. Now, this is all early days. Uh, none of this is proven. This is all speculation. But I think if we go back and begin to think, uh, rethink um, our view of computation, that in addition to what's happening locally, which is uh, very important, there's also these global considerations. There's global considerations in terms of the local neighborhoods that might be happening in terms of the local propagation. Globally, when you fall asleep, uh, these traveling waves could serve as a, 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 a way to link together in the medium all of the different parts of the cortex that are uh, important for long-term memory, complex memories. And this is, by the way, I think a challenge for the, uh, the deep learning um, effort because ultimately they're gonna wanna integrate all that information from all the different uh, uh, local experts in terms of their, their narrow, narrow domain knowledge. You have a network that does speech recognition, another one does object recognition images. How do you, how do you stitch together all those different networks that they're integrated, they're doing things together. Uh, well, we see nature may have been there before us because nature has been in the deep learning business for a long, long time. We don't know how it, it's done. Uh, Moving Poos has some very intriguing uh, mechanisms, but I think there are gonna be a lot more mechanisms that we haven't even uncovered yet. And, and we're beginning to see uh, traces of, of global patterns that I think are really intriguing. Uh, by the way, I should, uh, this is something my title you may have noticed was The Global Brain. I took that from the Simons Foundation that has a whole program, but I have to tell you that uh, none of the research I showed you here came from funding from the, from the Simons Global Brain, but of course I'm completely open to it. <laughs> <laughs> so let me end by, uh, first of all, thanking all my collaborators. This is uh, Lyle Muller, 
uh, none of the analysis that I showed you, it, it, none of the, 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 the results I could have showed you couldn't have been, could have been done with traditional ways of looking at peaks, which is what neuroscientists do. He used advanced analytic techniques from physics and fluid dynamics to look at the phase, uh, and that gives you much more accurate information. Um, but we also collaborated with uh, John Reynolds, uh, with Eric Hallgren and Sid Cash uh, on the ECOG experiments, and, and then over the last 20 years with a number of investigators and former postdocs. So I want to thank all of them and thank you. That was super fascinating. We have time for a few questions before the coffee break. There's one over here. That one's great. And Priyanka, come over here. Go ahead. Thank, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, so the standing waves data, oh, I'm over here. Hello. Okay. Uh, the recording data that you showed of the adult and the infant brain were fascinating. And something I noticed in the infant brain was that it seemed like the traveling wave actually had a reflection and it would switch directions a few times during the recording. Um, and I had two questions there. First was if you'd seen that type of reflection of a standing wave elsewhere in some of the waves that you've looked at. And the second question, um, in regards to that specific data that you showed, is uh, could that reflection be localized to a particular brain region and was it consistent in where it occurred? Okay, so uh, short answer, uh, we're in the process of analyzing that right now. It's, it's, by the way, these are enormously large, rich data sets that have been tremendous, I mean, uh, some, some, something that is happening in neuroscience is you know, big data, it's the era of big data. So uh, the fascinating, I, I noticed those uh, reversals too. Uh, by the way, uh, th th what's key to remember here uh, is that we're looking at individual uh, cycles. So in a two-second spindle, there may be 20 of these. And so you're seeing individual, in the past, people have averaged, and if you average, it all smears out. You would never see this. So it really is important to be able to analyze single trials at high temporal resolution. But uh, those, the question about the geometrical patterns, we know that, that that's uh, may give us a clue as to you know, which parts of the cortex are communicating with other parts, and so stay tuned. Over here, Terry. Hi. Terry, over here. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I believe for years, and I don't remember the source for this, that the hippocampal theta is driving the cortical oscillation, <coughs> and I'm wondering if it's just another stop in the traveling wave, or not a stop, but just another piece, or if maybe there's a pacemaker or a driver in the hippocampus, maybe how that comes in. Oh, okay, yeah, so for the first of all, um, the, uh, the theta occurs when the animal is locomoting and exploring. It, when it stops, theta stops. And interestingly, it goes into something called a sharp wave mode where the hippocampus is basically reading out to the cortex. So, um, and so now the question is, uh, you know, we, we, we just don't know, which is that uh, when the cortex is reading in, it's at the very top, the entorhinal cortex is feeding into it. Uh, what's the pattern of spikes going in? And this is a booming poos point, which is that, you know, we really have to look at spike timing now, but in, in the past, I think we've been blinded by the fact that we thought that, oh, the spike timing of a single neuron is important. No, the relative timing across the whole spatial array is what's important, and that hasn't been studied because most people only record from a few neurons at the same time. That's gonna change. With the Brain Initiative, we have tools now to record optically from a thousand neurons at the same time, from a, a project that Phil Alvelda, who is here, initiated at DARPA, it's, that's gonna go up to a million in humans in, in the next, over the next five years, a DARPA project. Joshua so here, and then put your hand up so that we can bring a mic to you. So just o a clarification, there. Qu a question. There is uh, REM sleep, non-REM sleep, awake, and maybe uh, resting states. So in which of these uh, are the traveling waves being observed and which uh, it doesn't seem to happen? Okay, uh, so yeah, we've studied uh, stage two sleep where you see spindles. Uh, we have not studied yet what happens in slow wave sleep. Uh, which is a, a delta two to four hertz. Uh, my guess is, from what I've told you, is that all of the things that we call oscillations are really traveling waves, and that uh, the, the, the and, and REM sleep is interesting because uh, very likely it's you know it, it, if it's almost indistinguishable from awake state. And in the awake state, we see lots of traveling waves. I showed you the ten hertz. Uh, their gamma waves are traveling waves. So. You know, so the how, 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 and by the way, gamma, because it's at a higher frequency, uh, is actually the traveling waves are much more local. So one of the principles is that uh, the lower the frequency, the larger the scale of the pattern, the coherent pattern. 
So all of these are wonderful questions, but you know, we're starting at the very beginning here. This is like, you know, we haven't seen this before. I remember when I was uh, starting out Johns Hopkins, my first job, uh, Mount Castle was uh, going f from single uh, recording electrodes to putting in probes that were recorded from on the order of 10 uh, neurons at the same time, and everybody scratched their head and said, what are you gonna get out of that that you can't get out of recording from one neuron at a time? You're just gonna be collecting data faster, right? There's nothing new, okay? Well, they were wrong. And over here, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for the inspiring talk. So I have some questions about the specifics maybe about the uh, directionality of uh, feed forward feedback and uh, what sort of uh, frequency band is associated with the, the, the traveling wave, direction of the traveling wave. Is it uh, specific to different frequencies, more traveling toward the feed forward direction? Okay, so wonderful question. Uh, so it's one of these uh, things that everybody who studies the cortex knows, but there's been so little work done on it that we really don't understand the feedback connections. Every feed-forward connection from V1 to V2 all the way up to infratemporal has a corresponding feedback connection, in many cases actually denser. And we just don't know what information is carried there, but they're there. And they were in our Kuramoto model. So that's why we could get, I, shouldn't, I didn't tell you, that we, in our model, by, by changing one parameter, we can actually get the thing to do circular pattern 70% of the time this direction and 30% of the time in that direction, because there are feedback connections. Uh, we don't know what that feedback is there for. We, one thing that uh, is, is uh, postulated has to do with attention, top-down attention, uh, some evidence for that. Uh, maybe it's carrying error-related signals. That would be nice for backprop people. But it's probably not backprop itself, but some related algorithm that carries information for plasticity to earlier stages in visual processing or auditory processing. So uh, stay tuned. We have new molecular techniques for being able to describe, uh, interestingly, using the pattern of methylation of the DNA. <laughs> uh, my group and Joe Ecker at the Salk Institute with the Brain Initiative uh, Project can fingerprint each of the pyramidal cells in the, in the cortex whether it's uh, what layer it's in and where it's projecting. And so we can selectively, genetically access each of those subpopulations. We should be able to turn them on and off and then actually do some experiments on, on those feedback connections. We have time for one more if there's another burning question. If not, thank you again, Terry. Awesome. <laughs>